I'm just adding more material like I don't have enough, but I do. <laughs> the songs they sang, uh, there's some lines in there that I'm not, I'm not sure if they knew what my message was this morning, but they hit home exactly with what part of what I'm going to talk about here this morning. Um, but Man of Sorrows is just one of my favorite songs altogether. So every, every portion of that is just such a great uh, demonstration and really a presentation of what God has done through us through his son, Jesus Christ. Every part of it, I, I just love the way it's put together. As Cindy even mentioned, the, the ability to put words together like that, they're all words we're familiar with. They just seem to put them together in a way that moves us. Uh, and that song always always gets me. So it's already been mentioned. Uh, three weeks from now, we are inviting in, receiving uh, a new pastor, Pastor Troy, uh, a young man, uh, an excited man, I believe. I think we are excited to receive him. And it is an exciting thing, but also a scary thing. Uh, and if you haven't thought of it as a scary thing, I'm here to scare you. Uh, no, it is an exciting thing. Today's message is not here, uh, is not meant to con necessarily convict you or to, to be a, a, uh, anything in that sort of manner. This is really to be an encouraging thing. Um, sometimes, though, uh, I remember uh, I was in a lot of athletics when I was uh, in middle school and high school. And... Uh, I played football since I was a, a second grade on up, uh, and there was a buddy of mine who is who is my best friend, apart from my wife, who is my best friend for life, my B a true BFF. Uh, he has been a, a, a friend and a companion since we were in second grade, since we were playing football. We were both stripers. If you don't know what that means, we were too big to run the ball, so they had to put a stripe on our helmet, helmet so that everybody knew, if that kid is running the ball, it's illegal. And he'll knock you down and hurt you. So they were, it was a way to protect. Uh, anyway, I remember in, in high school uh, to get my head back in the game. And we would do this with each other. If you played sports, you do this. Uh, you know, every once in a while, I'd have to get a smack on my helmet to get my face, my game, my head back to what the bigger picture was. Because sometimes I would get focused on one thing or a mistake or... Uh, a person. Sometimes I'd get fixated on a tight end who just dominated me. So now I'm I'm following. I'm I'm going to get that guy or a running back that plowed me over. I'm you know I'm now focused and fixated on that. So every once in a while I needed a good slap on the face, a helmet bump or something to get me. Hey, wake up. We got there's something bigger happening than just what you're focused on. So we're going to be kind of looking at that today. Not the football game of football though. That's a great. It's a great discussion in and of itself. We have an incredible opportunity to flow with whatever God is doing or going to do, though it may not be immediate. There'll be things that will change as we invite our new pastor in. He'll have ideas he'll want to implement. Uh, again, they may not be immediate, but over time, things will change. Uh, we pray and hope that we will support those changes and make them a positive thing. We have been praying for a new pastor, as been said, as we mentioned nearly every week, this is something we wanted, something we've uh, been praying for, and God has answered. We have put our faith in finding a new pastor swiftly, which a year to find a new pastor is very, is very quick, it's very swift. There are churches that go years and years and years, and this church has a history of that as well. God has answered that. The pastoral committee set out guidelines for what we wanted in a new pastor, and God answered that. Troy will be here in three weeks as God has called him here and answered our prayers, prayers in doing so. So let us be faithful to our prayers and God's answering and move with whatever God is doing in this church. Let us act as a whole Though made up of individual parts, let us move as one with our Lord and be a part of what he is doing here at Indy Grace. There is no doubt God has been faithful to this church. Let us let this church be ever faithful to him. Our scripture reading, as well our opening slide here, the body of Christ, 
points to the direction where I want us to go for today, a message that I believe is pertinent to this change coming, but also a good reminder in general every day that we are something more than our individual parts. We are a part of something bigger than our own thoughts and needs and wants. And the what we do while we are here is the individual part. The why is very specific. And we'll get in, hopefully get into that a little bit as well, as pertains even to these songs that we sing. That's really, that's really the what uh, and a part of the message that undergirds the why we're here. I had debated teaching on this, uh, as last week our guest speaker gave a good, brief lesson on this topic as part of his bigger message. Uh, his overall message was, what do you have in your hand that God can use for his glory? And he used examples, Moses, David, and a, a boy who had fish and bread that ultimately became a miraculous meal for thousands of people that Christ uh, gave food to while he was teaching. But I decided to stick with what I wanted to do and dig a little more deeply into this thing called the body of Christ. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross, his death, burial, and his resurrection, you are in the body of Christ. God has given you something to do. And if you haven't already been using it, I hope this message encourages you to do so. And if you don't know how you can be involved or how you can use whatever you have that God has given you, we'll be happy to help you. We'll be happy to help you find that. We'll be happy to plug you in in some way because that's God's purpose for you now as a part of the body of Christ. It may not be the same, and it's not going to be the same as what you might see on stage or what Dan does. with. Uh, and we feel the things, we feel the things uh, when those things that are done in the back rooms are, are missing because we're suddenly scrambling to figure out how to get them done. We didn't think about it. Uh, it could be anything. Let's find out what yours is so that you can also be a part of what is happening here. Let's read this passage again. Not necessarily together, I'll read it for you. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace has given, was given according to the measure of God's gift. That part was not necessarily in there, but it is now. We have more uh, to read if we continue and skip down to verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And this part here with uh, that we should no longer be children, this is something that is, is happening daily. That though we are waiting till all come to the unity of faith in Christ, we haven't gotten there yet. So we're growing up in it. We're growing up in it together. And I'll probably mess myself up here because I didn't have this listed, but I'm going to go back. That's what these images are to represent. We are the body, but we're not... We're not just left alone to our devices as the body. We are in the hands and we are following the feet of the one who is perfecting us, who is changing us, who is growing us, who, as this body works together, we are representing the body of Christ. But we are not there yet. We are not mature and grown. It's a process, and together we walk that process until that day we see Christ 
in his fullness, and our fullness is come with him. Now here we have, in 1 Corinthians, Paul teaches about, uh, pretty much says it almost exactly, but some, with some differences. He does so as well in Romans. This is not something that is a random, random thing that he just comments on in one book. He actually teaches about this three different parts, and some with much detail. And a lot of the doctrines and scriptures and passages that Paul goes on support what he's talking about here. This is the main idea. All of the, all of the things that are interactive between us deals with who we are in now in the body of Christ. You are individual, but you are also a part of something. So there is something individually you will have that will serve the bigger purpose. And sometimes we forget, we get stuck in that individual and I need to be slapped across the, the across the helmet and remember you have a position to play and if you fail at your position then the rest of our team struggles because someone else has to come up and cover your position because you're so fixated on getting the, uh, the sack on the quarterback uh, maybe stripping uh, the ball that you forgot that there are people that went downfield to throw the ball he, you're going to throw the ball to but you have forgotten or there's a trap play. There's all kinds of interesting things there. But sometimes I, the trap play always messed me up because I was always a sucker, like, uh, you know, a little dollar on a fishing hook that was dra- dragged across the yard. I went right on in like, like they wanted me to every time. I got caught up in my head. I was going to do harm to the quarterback. Sorry, quarterback. That was my job. <laughs> but I would miss other things because I was so consumed with my – idea of what I was there for, that I missed what I was there for as a team. And that's really kind of the same thing. Not exactly, but I like football, by the way. You are individual members, but a part of a greater body. And I like this, though this is not the intention of Da Vinci. This is uh, Da Vinci's artwork, um, sometimes called the proportions of man or man's proportions. Uh, it is actually called the Vitruvian Man. It was uh, kind of, in a way, a response to a particular architect that was very famous in Da Vinci's day. Um, and, and this was kind of a Da Vinci's response to that. He wanted to provide, uh, he, I guess at that point, this is just from what I read. I didn't know this intrinsically, obviously. But uh, at this point, this was kind of a jump start into his kind of obsession with proportions. Uh, But what he's trying to demonstrate here is man is proportional purposefully. Just as an architect builds with purpose, it's not just random things thrown together because it'll fall apart. That there's a, a level of recognition here that the body was purposeful and by design. Now whether or not da Vinci was recognizing altogether that God created uh, there's debate about that. However, the illustration that I'm trying to use here as a part of that is that, especially when we get into these passages, that all of the parts are important and God put them there for a reason. And in proportion. One is not more important than another, though sometimes it seems like that. Another analogy, since we talk about architecture, an analogy on an analogy of an analogy, everybody following so far? This is no longer, we're, we're, I'm off of football now, now we're talking about construction. When you look at a house without all of its stuff, when it's first built, you basically just see what the remnants of the foundation. There's more underground or there's more somewhere else, but uh, you typically just see the top portion and then you see the house on top of that and you see uh, you know, whatever beams are used, whatever rafters are there. You may, if you've seen a house when the framing is first gone up, uh, it's pretty cool. There's no wiring, there's no plumbing, there's no anything. It's just, you know, like, it's like a, it's like a play, open playground. Um, and then you slowly see, if you are fortunate enough to go check out houses in new construction, seeing all of the different developmental phases is pretty neat. But sometimes you see at this point, sometimes the plumbers get there before the electricians, or the electricians get there before the plumbers. You don't. So they gotta they gotta work together. See where I'm going? They have to work together to put this house together. It doesn't just happen, okay? But first, we have the foundation, 
and then you have the footings and all of the other things that support what's going to be built on top of that. This is a more simple schematic. It's not even really a schematic. It's just kind of a, hey, we need these things. And I know you can't read that little lettering, and I'm not going to try either. But they mentioned things like the ridge beam. Ridge beam is important. Even though it's on the very top of the house, it actually holds the house together. Uh, and it distribute, helps distribute the weight of the roof down to the foundation and all the walls and everything. It's what they're actually doing. The walls are there to protect you from the weather, but more importantly, they're there to hold up the weight of the house. And sometimes, we, you know, unless you are involved with it, you don't think about all of the little things that go on. Uh, there are load-supporting walls. There are some walls that you, if you had a hammer, you could go to town and have no problem with it. I would check before you start doing that, though, because a load-bearing wall is, is very important, and sooner or later, your roof is going to fall. So you need to have certain structures, depending on how elaborate your house is. If it's a simple house, it doesn't need as much. If it's in a lot big elaborate house uh, with dimensional uh, roof, you know, different. it's not all just one straight, nice little A-frame like that. It's got multiple levels, multiple division, uh, uh, dim dimensions, uh, and the like. But it's considered even with the most simple. Now... And this is still yet not even a full schematic. This is just kind of a thing that shows these are even more of all of the things that go into a house that uh, a builder has to think of, a, a, a developer has to think of when they first start. They lay all these things out and they, they start kind of working out how much it's going to cost, what all of the little things go into. It's not just beams, it's not just wood, it's not just concrete, there's screws, uh, there's little pancake boxes that the, electric, the wiring goes into, you've got receptacles that the uh, wiring goes into, you've got HVAC, all of this stuff that has to be thought and has to be planned. And so they lay it out like this. And the bigger you get, think of an opera house, think of a movie theater, think of a skyscraper, think of Lucas Oil Stadium with its retractable roof, how much has to be thought and planned and worked, and how many different people are working on that together. It didn't just show up. It took time. And there were different people with different abilities and different uh, ideas and different things that came together to put that together. There were people who just thought, and there were people who just worked. But there was a bigger plan and a bigger thing going on to get that accomplished. So the foundation is laid, and the foundation is very important, and oftentimes that's where we leave it off. The foundation, we, when we relate that to the gospel, we relate that to what uh, we do here, we, the foundation, the foundation is Jesus, right? Paul says that, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen? Absolutely. There's no other foundation. But did you know that that's not the first part? Someone has to plan it, and God did that also. It was not uh, simply that it just began with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It began long before that. He knew what he wanted. And they, they considered it and planned it accordingly. In our knowledge of the house, once the foundation is set, once the framing is up, once the roof is on, the work has only just begun. That's actually a fairly quick process of the house. You have to consider the electrical, where everything is going to go, where's the power going to come in, where's the service panel going to be. How big is the house? Does it need two service panels? Is it a, a commercial building? Does it need multiple panel, panels? And, and each part of that commercial building might be its own office, so then it has its own service and it has its own wiring, it has its own, uh, you know, whatever it might be. Lighting and all of that stuff, they need to be uh, considered. And then you have plumbing. Uh, plumbing is not just the tub and the sink. It's also your water heater. It's also how we get water uh, from the sink and the toilets out of the house. How do we get water in the toilets so that you can use them? Uh, which part of the water is going to be softened? If you want a softener here in Indiana, if you don't, then you have extremely hard water, and some of those things are probably destroyed. We had to replace our piping because we had black pipe in our house. Our house is 80 years old by now, and we had to replace it because... The, you know, the iron and everything in the water just ate it away. 
So in building, they have to build, they have to use all the appropriate things that is even in that environment. Uh, some states don't require uh, as much as other states. Other states require you to be green, you to be you to build with particular materials. They won't allow other materials, all of these things, right? So there's a lot of thinking, a lot of planning, and it has to be laid out. Where is the bathroom? How far do we go to get to the bathroom? Where does the water come in to the house? How do we place the house so that we can have the best flow of the water and, and all of those things? Then you have HVAC, which is a kind of plumbing, but not entirely. Sometimes plumbers will install the HVAC, but you've got, if you want a heated or cooled house, then it has to be worked out. The square footage has to be worked out. You have to have the appropriate size uh, unit in order to service that house. And some, again, some houses are big. Uh, I worked on one house in, uh, up on Allisonville Road that was actually Larry Bird's, one of Larry Bird's houses. And he had four furnaces, I believe, in that house, but it's Larry Bird, so uh, he could afford it. But some houses are, are huge. And they need more than just one thing. Some houses are small, like ours, and, and one one unit is just fine. Uh, though we have no insulation, so maybe we need to just to kind of keep things. We feel it in the summertime. So, but even still, it isn't finished. Even after these things, there's drywall, there's flooring, there's cabinetry, there's appliance, there's siding, there's lighting, all kinds of things. And then paint. What color of paint do you want? Uh, and then once that's all done, then you got to move in and you got because you have the space, you have to fill it. So now we've got to get furniture. Now we got to it's ne it's a never ending thing. And, and really, the application starts to get a little out of hand when you start thinking about all the little things. But but the reality is, is that there's not there are people in history that have built their homes from the ground up. But that's not what I'm talking about. For the most part, you drive around and you see these uh, developments. There are multiple, multiple, not just people, businesses, companies, teams that are in within themselves, multiple people that are doing this, that are building these houses. And that's just houses. That's not skyscrapers. That's not these monstrosities of things. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative sense. They're, they're beautiful. Luke Soil Stadium is a beautiful building. But the principle is, is the same for each one. The same is for the body of Christ. It's not, we're not building a building, we're building a, a, a faith, so to speak, in the sense that Christ came when you put your faith in him. We now are a part of this building of the, of the faith because of what he has done for us. Paul writes this, again, that this uh, was planned, that the foundation is Christ, but he also moved the earth, created drainage, uh, planned the roads, uh, plant, plotted the land, all of those things. Christ worked out. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Not that he was picked as a believer, but that, he was, uh, that the process by which that believer would grow and learn and be a part of God's process was predetermined, was predestined. That he might be firstborn among many brethren, that is Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.11 says something similar. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. 1 Corinthians 2.7 reads, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. So this was well thought. It was not uh, suddenly there was this building that showed up and no one knew how I got there. So however you want to play out the analogy, either we are laying the parts or we are the parts. The idea is one of many individual parts, one many individuals building or being the common structure for God's common uh, purpose, for his glory and to... Uh, offer the world his ministry of reconciliation. We read in Romans 12 something similar as, uh, as Ephesians, our Ephesians passage for today. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ 
and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that was given that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And I like this passage because so oftentimes we get caught up in the gifts of the spirit or uh, the spiritual gifts and and a, a lot of times we look to passages like 1 Corinthians where it just kind of has a smaller list and we think we say that those are the things we should uh, chase after. But Paul also makes a, a comment further down from those passages in context that there is yet something still even greater. We'll come to that here in a minute. But I like this passage because it adds some things that are kind of mixed in with, I don't believe those uh, primary, those starting, those foundational gifts like prophecy and apostleship and all of those things that I believe were purposed for the beginnings of the body of Christ, but are not necessarily needed today. However, we have things that I don't necessarily believe that are uh, only beginning gifts. I believe that they are gifts that are still for us today, like ministering. Surely we can agree that ministry goes on today. Uh, giving, teaching, exhortation, and mercy and cheerfulness, leading, all of those things. There's uh, the idea going back to a building, there's a foundation that's laid, but once it's laid, you don't have to go back and do it again, right? It's there, but there's still more to be done. Once you get the framing up, you don't have to go back and now you might remodel and all those things. That's where analogies fall apart, right? I'm sure you can come up with something. But the idea is that if all else is good, you don't need to go back and do it again. However, there's a bunch of little details and little things that still need to occur. The house is not done. I'm not going to go live in a house that has only a roof and no walls. And it's just stick, right? I want walls. I want wrap, uh, siding. I want brick. I want st whatever it is. I want heat and warmth. I want to be able to uh, turn on a, uh, an oven and cook food or have electricity to refrigerate that food. I want to be able to take a shower and all those things, right? Those things are built out later, but the, the primary things are there. The other things are easily changed, easily moved, but that foundation is there. If you add to it or subtract from it, you've got to go back to planning and, and reassessing everything. You can't just take care of it. So again, that's where the analogy fails, I'm sure. There are examples and things in your mind if you're remodeling or doing any of that. Uh, but in generally speaking, I think the analogy holds pretty well. 1 Corinthians 12 reads, There are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all not for the individual, but for all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning the spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills, as God wills. So, yes, you're going. You may, you have something. I strongly believe you have something. Whether it's uh, helping install the gas oven or, you know, painting. I don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. It's all, it's all important to the house owner. It's all important. And you may look through swatches of paint for months before you decide that one paint. Slap that paint on and decide, I don't want that. Now I'm gonna, i got to go back and look at some more swatches, right? To that house owner, that's important. It may not necessarily feel that way to the painter. But the painter goes and paints. And sometimes I think we feel that, that our thing is not important. But it is. It's important for one reason, if only one reason, is because God gave it to you to perform, to encourage, to strengthen the body of Christ. For as the body is one and has many members, 
but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For the one spirit, or for by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in, the, in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, like Mike Wazowski here, where would the, be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? So the demonstration here is that even though, it, it, and we do this all the time, I do it all the time, you take for granted, you're smelling until you get a cold. And you're like, I can't smell anything. Or I can't, now I can't taste anything. They're connected, right? Or until, you, you know, uh, I get, when I get tired, I get real emotional when I get tired because I think I'm just, I'm, I'm out of whack. So then it's like, you know, uh, e even the inner parts, not just my hands and my nose, and my, but the, the way the body works, the hormones, uh, the electrical processes that are going, that are firing off in my brain, all of these things are working together for me to work and function as a person, just like you in the body of Christ. And if one looks at another, and we do this often as well, right? I'm guilty of it. Maybe you're not. I hope that you're not. Uh, I've got, I, I have kind of a guilty conscience a lot of times. I think I'm always doing something wrong. Uh, but sometimes you look at someone else and you think, wow, look at what they're doing. I'm not, I'm not doing that. That's not, that, that seems amazing. Or you look at that person and say, I can't do that. Uh, well, maybe you're not supposed to. And that's okay. But God has something for you. And it's not grand, maybe sometimes on, uh, as to the human perspective, sometimes we like to label someone as a great speaker, and that's the person that we hold up on a high pedestal, but we forgot that someone set up the sound for that great speaker, and someone may have uh, arranged everyone to come there, and someone may have all these little parts that go on, or they sing, they practice singing uh, before this great speaker shows up, and they are a part of that choir and are a part of the process. Sometimes we get hung up on that greatness that we see that we forget. It's all great. Why? Because it's from God. Whether great or small, God has given it to you to use for his glory. And that's great. So be encouraged in that if you are discouraged by what you have in mind of greater people. I like this part because we do get hung up uh, the Corinthians were hung up on some of these lists of tongues and prophecy and all of these things. But Paul criticizes that and, in fact, uh, offers something different, which I think is a preparation for us today, when those things would no longer be important, those things would no longer even be in use. There is still yet something that is far greater than all of them. He says this in First. Uh, did I skip? I skipped. We read, let me just get there. Oh, wait a second. Did I miss an entire thing? I missed an entire thing. So I'm just going to go somehow. That's why my pages were only so. I thought eight pages wasn't enough for me. <laughs> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us to the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and, he has, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. So there is a purpose uh, for this. The whole purpose is not for you individually, it's for you individually to be a part of the reconciliation ministry that God has for the body of Christ that was began or begotten, if you will, through Jesus Christ. That is ultimately the goal here that we are working toward. Now to continue with what I was, because uh, I just got them switched. So switch back with me if you can to what I thought I missed, but apparently I just have it misordered. First, First Corinthians twelve twenty nine through thirty, Paul says, "Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? 
Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? The answer is no, no, not all do. Now he had many of them. He said that I have many of these gifts, and he does not. He does not criticize them for desiring those gifts. What he eventually says is that those things are not the end all be all. There's something even greater than that that was demonstrated on the cross. But there is something even greater than that that if I work out all of these things that you think are great and I have not that, it doesn't matter anyway. We'll look at that. But the answer is, no, not all are apostles, not all are prophets, not all are teachers, not all are musicians, not all are up here to sing, not all are to do the sound, not all. There's some, but there is something. There is something God has for you. And we want to help you find it. So going back to our ministry of reconciliation, we are here to help that ministry that God has started through Jesus Christ. So jumping back now to 2 Corinthians 5 here. You have a part to play in what God is doing, and you will have a part to play in what God is going to do here in, in, over the next years as we receive Pastor Troy. In all of God's sovereignty, he knew you would be here at this church. And he's given you something for this church, even in this moment. The production and the encouragement and the betterment of the body and the ministry of reconciliation working together towards that common goal. Be assured of that. In so doing, however, now this is the warning part. This is my, hopefully, I, this is the slap across the helmet, wake you up part, if you are caught up in this. I have been too. I'm including myself in this group. But let's, again, work this together and see what the warnings are that God has for us as we work together in this body toward the ministry of reconciliation. In so doing, working together individually, there will always be our flesh that wants to creep in and have its place at the table. As we apply whatever grace God has given to us, our flesh will resist. Proverbs 13.10 says, Where there is strife, there is pride. This is the NIV version. I like the NIV a little better because it lays this out. Pride, the self, I will, is ultimately really to blame for the divisions that we have. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. 1 Corinthians 3.3 3, For you are still carnal. This is speaking to the Corinthians, but I believe that oftentimes we might see ourselves in here. For where there are, where are there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? How do we combat this? This flesh that we have. Philippians 2, 14 through 15. Do all things without complaining and disputing. That's tough. That's a tough one, isn't it? Where are we going to go to lunch after that? I don't know. They may not become disputing, but we're going to, right? There's a discussion. With every discussion, there's an opportunity for argument. Hopefully it doesn't. We're all going to Yakimos, right? I haven't talked about it with my wife, so now we are going to have a discussion about that. Hopefully there will be no strife. I'm not saying we're going to Yakimos. It does sound good, though. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Today is not the only day that we have crookedness and, and all of those things. Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago. There's always been crookedness, divisiveness. There's always been a challenge to what is spiritual and true in God's word and in God's truth. Always. There's always been. Satan has always contested. He even contested that as, we, uh, as we've been studying in Genesis. Eve, what's God's truth? He's already contested. Right out the gate. The Corinthians knew this struggle. That's why this whole subject came about. Paul needed to set them straight about these gifts given and their purpose. And that even the gifts themselves are not the goal or the greatest we can do for each other in ministry for the Lord. 1 Corinthians 12.31 and 13, 1 and 2 say this, but earnestly desire the best, 
really the, the idea of that is more useful, not what we might say is the best, but rather what is the most, what is more useful. Gifts. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. So you Corinthians who are hung up on tongues and prophecy, there's, you're not even really looking at the most excellent way that there is. Something even better. Something that is preeminent uh, above those things. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love. Here it is. I have become a sounding brass or a claiming, clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So ultimately, what drives this body of Christ is love. Godly love, not love however it's defined, however you feel it at the time. But godly love, and God defines that. I, I urge you to go read through chapter 13 again of uh, 1 Corinthians. It lays out what godly love is. Jesus says there is no greater love than this. And he's speaking specifically to himself there, but it is the truth in general that he laid down, that I lay down, Christ laid down his life for another. There's no greater love than what Christ did on the cross. But that is an example of the love that we should share with you and show with each other. Laying down of self so that we can be a body, even though individually you may have a really, in my mind, spectacular gift. In God's mind, it's not if it's, if it's without love. It means nothing if it's not with love. In Romans 12, 9, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. And that word hypocrisy gets thrown around and misused. That's not saying that I'm trying to teach you what is right in God's word, and I struggle with it too. That's not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is I have no intention. I'm just acting it out, telling you how you should be, and I'm going to be in an, with all intention to go be this other person. But I'm that really the Greek is an actor, a person who acts, who plays out a part in a play, but is not that person at all. That's not hypocrisy. Is not well. You tell me to do this, but you also don't do it. That's not hypocrisy. Does that make sense? We're all going to struggle. We all have flesh. God's word is still God's word. And if one who might struggle with a thing is preaching it, it may be just the message for them that they need to hear as well. But those are that is not the same. We love each other. We uh, confess to one another. We slap each other on the helmet sometimes if we need. Even though my friend Bobby needed a couple times a good slap in the helmet too. That doesn't mean that I didn't need it when I needed it. He needs it when he needs it. Okay? We both were a little fiery when it came to full contact sports. Okay. Our passage today echoes those ideals, these doctrines. Paul has this in mind in many passages. In Ephesians 4, back to Ephesians 4, 15 through 16. But speaking truth, uh, the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So again, it's not, hypoc it's not uh, Hippocratic or hip what is the term? Hypocrisy. For me to share the truth in your life, because I may need it later also. That is something that I struggle with. But that is what we are called to do. To speak God's truth in each other's life. Why? To maintain this unity. To grow up in Christ. And fulfill what he has set out for the body of Christ. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. According to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And I looked all these words up. This is all agape. This is all agape love, godly love. And again, I urge you uh, to go to and read for yourself and, and look at those things. What is godly love? Because the world tries to tell us otherwise what love is, what real love is. There are different aspects of love. I admit, but the greatest love is something far more than the world pushes, far more than the world desires. Let's study that and look at that and apply that to our lives in some way, if, if we can. Let the Holy Spirit strengthen us and give us the ability to walk in those ways. I find it interesting structurally 
Then in the same, now we, we divide the chapters and all of those things, but I find it interesting structurally that when Paul talks about that it's at the end of the chapter uh, that he's talking about the gifts and the beginning of the following chapter, he's talking about the love. And that if it doesn't matter what gifts you have, if you're not acting according to love, it's useless anyway. Again, we make those, but in his argument, he's put those together in, in, in all of those parts. We see that again here, as we saw in 1 Corinthians, Ephesians 4, 32 and 5, 1 and 2. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. There's that children again. We have not yet reached that maturity. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We must encourage each other in this walk, in this building of the body. Why? Because Christ first loved us. So now our expression, as Don mentioned a, a couple weeks ago, it is, it is uh, our re appropriate response. It is uh, a call that we respond as Christ loved us. For yet we were, so for while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We put that first. We put that in the foremost of our thoughts whenever we approach, and that's difficult. I don't do that. But that's what we're striving for. That's what we're working towards. And we help each other do that. Not out of spite. Not to say, I told you you were going to. But brother, sister, you're falling that way. Come back here. Because that is the ultimate goal is for us to be unified for the ministry of reconciliation. And that's what we're looking forward to in the next few weeks. Not just in that few. Don't put it off until then. Let's do that every day. Every moment we have a chance. Let's keep this in our minds. How do we do this? Well, one is do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's the toughest one for me. I, I am often resistant uh, until I am reminded these things. Colossians 3.13 says, Bearing with one another and forgive, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And Philippians reads this, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not for your own interests, but the interests of others. But still, we will have those who will strife continually and not uh, relent their ideals, their perspectives, their preferences. God has a word for that as well. And this is the toughest of all of them because we just read that we should love and forgive and all of these things. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that people can run amok within the body of Christ. We must deal with them as well. Romans 16 reads, Now I urge you, brethren, note that those who cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learn, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. This is a real thing. It does happen in churches. I've seen churches that I help uh, grow fall apart very quickly because of one or two people that have this this power to be divisive and if it's not handled it will tear apart Titus says this but avoid foolish disputes gene genealogies contentions and striving about the law for they are unprofitable and useless reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition so we have this all of these things that we apply individually to the body 
and this mysterious body I don't fully get, and I don't believe that the lists that we have of gifts is exhaustive. I believe that one can uh, think of something, especially today, we've got new technologies and all of these things, ministries can be had. Uh, I like the way uh, Dean Patayhog mentioned last week, and I'm paraphrasing, it's not exactly what he said, but the idea is that God's word and his doctrine are solid, but ministries are flexible. It might be a ministry that works just fine with God's doctrine. Let's not be quick to dismiss those that something uh, God may have put on someone's heart because of our preferences. We'll check the doctrine. Absolutely. Does it defile? Does it diminish? Does it take away from God's word? No. Well, why not? Let's, let's check it out. It's not what I like, but it might grab some people that do, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to grab people and bring them into the body of Christ. We're trying to be desirable as we love each other that others who are looking upon us will say, hey, I, I, I don't have that in my life. I want to be a part of that. Ultimately, that is what we are doing. Flooring is not doctrine. Say that with me. Flooring is not doctrine. We'll try it one more time. Flooring is not doctrine. Why do I say that? Because there was a church that I was part of, a, a part of that actually had division in the church because they argued over the floor. Flooring is not doctrine. Drums are not doctrine. Lighting is not doctrine. Graphic t-shirts or shirt and ties are not doctrine. The reconciliation through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is doctrine. How we love each other, how we uh, commit to one another, how we interact as a body of Christ, that's doctrine. Whether or not you have a slogan on your shirt, unless it's violating God's doctrine in some way, is not doctrine. Right. Some of the songs we sing have doctrinal things in them, but the style in which they are presented is not doctrine. I've had all of these arguments through my years of life, especially with music, as to what is appropriate and what is not. I don't want to offend anybody, but at the same time, I will slap you across the helmet if you need it. <laughs> okay. The content is more important than the presentation. I will leave with this, Colossians 1.15, let this sink into our minds and let this be our minds as we move forward, uh, not just when Troy suddenly shows up, but now, today, tomorrow, uh, with, with how we interact in everyday life. Let us remember that Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that is in all things he may, uh, that in all things he may have the preeminence. In the body, but also in your life. That you have the preeminence in your life. It is not about you. It is about you being a part of what is going on with him. That's tough. Amen? That's tough for me. I hope I'm not the only person in here. <laughs> don't admit it. But it is for me. I don't, you know, I get selfish. I have my own preferences. Uh, we're going to, you know, every time we talk about movie night or game night, I'll admit I'm always thinking, well, I don't know. What do I want to do? You know, instead of let's have a conversation and decide what we're going to do together. Sometimes I may sway that argument toward the thing I want. You girls, you don't know that now. Forget that I said that. <laughs> but it is not about us, about what we want. It's a part of it. You're not supposed to, just as, as Paul says, think not of your own selves only, but think of others as well. We all are thinking. Don't just leave out the other. Thinking about eating is fine. Thinking about maybe I need to take a shower, that's fine, okay? The things that you need, it's natural. But don't leave out everyone else for your own ambitious gain. Remember that this is about Christ. It has, uh, all these things have their being and consist in him, are through him and for him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the body that you have chosen to be a vessel for your glory, for this ministry of reconciliation. We pray uh, 
not just for what will become of us in the next three weeks, um, but what we do in these next three weeks as well. Uh, and whatever future you have for this specific church, that we bring you glory and honor with uh, remembering these words. Thank you again for your son. Thank you for his shed blood on the cross, his death, burial, and his resurrection. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.